So I always joke that when I have my talks, it's nothing but disease pictures. So I decided to shake things up a bit to put healthy pictures on my title slide for this talk. You know, just to sort of throw you. Um, so we got some healthy peaches and healthy apples. So I'm going to talk about uh, four diseases, or three diseases in one issue. I can't really call it a disease, it's an issue. Um, the, we're going to talk about pear trellis rust. This is new east of the Mississippi, newer I should say. We'll talk about rhizopus rot on peaches. Um, this came on my radar. This isn't new. This is more I learned something last year and I wanted to impart my knowledge uh, with regards to what I learned last year. Talk about crown gall. This isn't new either, however, um, it was a problem over the last year with some growers and I just realized I needed to um, kind of educate folks as far as what to look for uh, when they're planting or when they notice something kind of amiss. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is rapid apple decline, which is a mystery at this point. But uh, I will uh, mention it and there may be some people in here that may relate to it. Um, and if those people relate to it, I will need your attention at the very, very end. So, so first, uh, pear trellis rust. This is native in Europe. It came to the Pacific Northwest in the late 90s or somewhere in the 90s. And the spores, they probably followed the jet stream and they, they came to the East Coast. Um, this is just your typical rust. Um, it was found in discovered in Pennsylvania in 2013, but you know, it may have been here earlier than that. I'm assuming it's in Maryland just because I know it's definitely in Franklin County, very close to the Maryland border. Um, it's on ornamental pears and orchard pears. So where the most noise where I've heard about this is mainly from homeowners who, whose pears have looked funny, they've had these orange spots that look like this up here, and they're wondering what's going on, and it's a rust. And I will say, by the time you see spots, it's too late to control the disease for that season. So like all rust pathogens, it requires two alternate hosts. In the case here, we have pear, and its alternate hosts are the juniper. And new junipers are a dime a dozen, and there's a lot of different juniper species that are susceptible to this. So you know, how rust occurs is that you know, you've galls that form on the branches of junipers. And then in the spring, those galls will become wet. They'll start spewing spores. Those spores will find their way to pears. The pears then, it causes a lesion. And then later in the season, you'll see these reproductive structures underneath the leaves, uh, on the, the underside of the leaves. These structures will spew spores. They'll go to the juniper, infect the juniper, and then the process starts all over again. Um, so it's a vicious process. Uh, obviously, it can be pretty bad in the sense not only can cause leaf spots, but if there's lots of leaf spots, you can get premature defoliation and consequently stress of the tree. As far as the weather conditions for this, wet weather, scab weather and rust weather are very same. So when it's apple scab weather, it's also rust weather. As far as kind of looking at it a little more closely, uh, in this case, one lesion is one spore in this, in, this, in this instance. So you have, you see one spore landed here, it's nice orange, yellowish. Rust makes very colorful lesions. It may even be a little bit pink. That's how I've seen some of them. And this was the fruit as well. So the fruit is slightly, the uh, lesion was slightly raised. It's discolored, it's kind of reddish. And here there was fruit, the, the lesion actually was on the underside of, of the fruit, pear fruit there. So this is similar to cedar apple rust. So if you're familiar with rust, cedar apple rust or quince rust, it's very similar. But the reason why I just want to put it on your radar is that it goes to ornamental pears very well too. So you may, this may sneak up on you. And as far as control, well, you can get rid of the alternate host, the juniper, but that's super difficult. Uh, spores can travel on wind currents. So even if you may have removed all the junipers in your area, you may get spores from a few miles down the road. Uh, but the galls, there's some galls uh, that do form on the pear trees. So if you do encounter this, you may see growths on the branches of pear trees. You can remove that, so that will help. When it comes to rust, you have to have the protection on prior to the infection event. Unlike scab, where when you get scab infection on leaves, 
You can get more infection in the tree over time. That's not the case with rust. Once you see lesions on the leaves, and this is cedar apple rust here, that's it. There's nothing you can do. Basically, in this case, I just waited for the leaves to defoliate from the tree. This was in this block, apple block here. It wasn't adequate, adequately controlled, and the, all of the trees defoliated prematurely as a result. So just keep that in mind when you're protecting uh, for any rust pathogen, you need the protection on prior to the infection event. Uh, so any questions about rust real quick? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, ornamental pears are susceptible. I know um, Dr. Keith Yoder came and visited me um, uh, in July, and he stopped at the Sheets near 81 in Chambersburg, and there was a Bradford pear right next to the Sheets, and it was loaded with pear trellis rust. So it, you know, ornamental pears are very susceptible. Any other quick rust questions? Okay, so on to rhizopus rot. This was, this is typically a post-harvest issue. You really don't notice it until the fruit have been harvested from the tree. And this was problematic in 2016. Uh, it, it was on, that's when it uh, officially came on my radar. Uh, again, it's not in it, it's, it's, if you can adequately control for it and you don't bruise your fruit and you don't wound your fruit in any way, this isn't an issue. However, very ripe fruit or fruit that is staying, that can be slightly bruised and it's staying at room temperature or slightly below room temperature is very susceptible to rhizopus rot. So unripe fruit, they aren't susceptible to it. And the early symptoms of rhizopus rot, small brown lesions, that's indistinguishable from brown rot. The diagnostic characteristic is that the skin will slip and this is an example of skin slippage here. So that's a real characteristic. When the temps are warm, the fungus can appear overnight. This, these were kept at 70 degrees. It was an air-conditioned room. This was a brown rot trial that turned into a rhizopus rot trial. <laughs> uh, my, I should say my post-harvest brown rot trial turned into a post-harvest rhizopus rot trial. Overnight, all these, a lot of these fruits sprouted black beards. I mean, it was just overnight. It, I was incredulous. However, I did learn something in the process. It's really difficult to, there, as far as managing it culturally, uh, the spores live on the, on the orchard floor. So there's not an issue where, or, or a situation where you can remove like mummies or leaves and, get, and limit the spores. It's not the case with rhizopus rot. Why I think it was an issue this year is that it was very dry. It was a very dry summer. And it was very dry the week leading up to peach harvest for loring. This was loring. And I believe what had happened was that there's probably a lot of rhizopus spores that had just been kicked up on the orchard floor. They'd landed on the peaches and it didn't take long and this, was, this is what happened. So for the peach growers in here, what I recommend is that keep an eye on the weather leading up to, well, all season, but especially leading up to harvest. In the week before harvest, I recommend either Marivon or Luna Sensation, um, the frat code group 7 and 11. These are labeled to manage rhizopus rot. Do you know what's not labeled for rhizopus rot? Indar. That's what I used. And so that's what I learned is that Indar, it's not labeled for rhizopus rot. But I really wasn't thinking about rhizopus rot. I was thinking about brown rot. So, if it's really dry conditions, for whatever reason, it seems that the dry weather kicking up the spores just made it a really ideal situation. So Marivon or Luna Sensation will definitely hold things in check with regards to rhizopus rot. Of course, if you're able to keep your fruit refrigerated, especially if they are going in and out with, if you have a roadside stand or you know, you're transporting to and from, it's always good to keep those fruit chilled because the fungus won't grow in cold temperatures, you know, minimize wounding as far as being careful with handling. And then finally, <clears throat> as far as a, there is a cultural method you can use, and that is keeping things clean, keeping your bins clean, keeping your storage areas clean. So any quick questions about rhizopus rot? Okay, crown gall. So crown gall, what I noticed 
in the last year was that there were some issues on newly planted trees, uh, trees that have been in the ground a year. And so just to refresh your memory about crown gall, it's caused by a bacteria, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And the bacteria causes tumor growth on the roots or the crown of the plant. Um, crown gall is very common among many different hosts, just not apple. I know it's common in roses. Uh, grapes, you may have heard crown gall and grapes. It's, it's, uh, crown gall is very important in grapes. What happens is that the bacteria will inject its DNA into root cells and then that DNA um, gets integrated and it basically triggers the cells to re reproduce cr like crazy and it causes a tumor, causes a growth. What happens is that this tumor can destroy tissue. And so as if it's destroying root tissue, it's going to impact the growth and productivity of the tree. And also the galls can provide an entry point for opportunistic fungi that are lurking around because it's a wound, it's an entry point. Along the same lines with wounds is that that's how the bacteria gets in. It needs a wound to get in. The bacteria can survive in many soils with good aeration. Sandy loam is, is very ideal for, for crown gall. And unfortunately, it can also survive on the roots of many orchard weeds. Um, when you have crown gall and it's in the soil, it's really tough to get rid of. Uh, fumigation works to a point. But we have not, as far as I'm aware, there are no biocontrols to limit agrobacterium in the soil itself, uh, which is pretty challenging. So if you know you have crown gall, there are steps you can take to prevent crown gall from occurring, and I'll talk about those in a minute. So how this all started is that a, a grower in Adams County had dropped some trees off late in 2015 and he said, something's wrong with my trees. They didn't produce as much as far as growth in their first year. I plant them in 2015. This was in November of 2015. I looked at them, first thing I go to, oh, that's fire blight. <laughs> they didn't look quite right. But I just, I was like, this isn't, these aren't fire blight symptoms. And I didn't look at the roots real closely because there was quite a bit of dirt on the roots. So he came back again in May and he brought more trees and this time we looked at the roots much more closely. We washed the dirt off, we went to his orchard and we grabbed some more trees and what we found when we washed the dirt off is that there were galls on the roots, on the root stock. So if people are very in tune to seeing galls on the crown or galls in some of these side roots which I've heard as far as folks I'm saying, is this the same thing or the galls that I cut off my roots before I plant them? And I haven't seen those galls, but I would say yes, that would may could potentially be crown gall. But these are very knotty. In, in this case, it was right on the rootstock, and it was at the tip of the rootstock too. So when you are planting, oftentimes your eyes aren't drawn to that. So this is a, a learning moment for folks, is that when you get brand new trees, it's worth the, worth the extra effort to definitely clean off any residual soil to look closely at that rootstock. This was a positive identification for crown gall at the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. They used molecular tools to identify this. They detected the DNA of Agrobacterium tumefaciens, so this was a positive. There is another grower that was also having issues where his trees weren't producing quite enough. He lost a bunch of trees within the first year of planting. We went and visited him in late in August of 2016. And so his orchard block looked okay. I mean, the growth of the trees weren't, wasn't as good as I want to see after a year in the ground, but it wasn't terrible. And when we pulled up some weak trees, we did notice crown gall, and this was confirmed positive. But we also noticed this massive flush of roots. And we believe that the reason why the trees looked pretty decent above is because of this massive root system. What the grower then told me, he said, the trees were looking pretty weak when I planted them in the first year. I said, I didn't like that, so I des he decided to fertilize them which went, goes against sort of the rule of thumb in trees that are planted in the first year. But he decided, uh-uh, I want to give these trees a good shot. So he fertilized them. And as a result, uh, that was the right thing to do because 
he pushed, there was a massive flush of root growth, and I believe that massive flush of root growth was compensating for the crown gall there. This was confirmed positive by the um, PA Department of Ag. And so there were other trees too, and then here you have the crown gall symptoms, again, at the tip of the rootstock. When we brought it to the lab, we washed off more dirt, and the crown gall was just pervasive all along the rootstock. So this was a little unsettling to see these trees because the sort of the white elephant in the room is that for crown gall to be established on this, one of two things either happened. Either that site, both of these sites were virgin sites. They were in corn and soybeans prior to this. They either picked it up there or the trees may have came, come with it. And so for the galls to be that big, most likely the trees potentially could have come with the crown gall. So that's why this is sort of a, um, a, a good lesson for growers that when you get your new trees from a, from a nursery, make sure you inspect them really closely. Uh, wash the dirt off the roots. Take pictures if anything looks suspicious so you docu document it. Contact me or contact your um, crop advisor or someone as far as if you need a second opinion. So it's really important to scrutinize the trees prior to going in the soil. If anything looks amiss or if you want to just err on the side of caution regardless, there are two products that are available to prevent crown gall, or I should say prevent wounds from getting crown gall. So if there's any bacteria that could be lurking on the roots, you could apply these chemicals. The one that I'm most familiar with and based on anecdotal evidence, because I've known people that have used this, is Galtrol. And Galtrol is a good agrobacterium. And the good agrobacterium is going to protect any potential wounds on the rootstock and prevent the bad bacteria from coming in if there's a wound there. Um, how it's been used is I know um, a, a, a crop advisor whose family has an almond orchard grove, um, what do they call almond, uh, almonds, they grow almonds out in California and they swear by this. They always plant their almond trees and they spray this solution on the roots prior to planting. People have asked about dipping. I'm assuming dipping's okay. I think the reason why they always sprayed was because it was easier to spray than to dip. The other products, Golex, this is a chemical. I'm not familiar with this at all. This is uh, based on the company's website because both of these products are from the same website. This says that it will penetrate the gall and kill it. I do not know if this is true or not, hence why it's in quotes, because this is from the company's website. Uh, but what I've read about these products is that there is nothing that surefire kills or gets rid of the galls. It just basically prevents wounds from getting the agrobacterium um, entering into them. So that's, that's what I know about that. As far as, uh, so these growers that knew they have crown gall and they found out or say you had some trees and then you found out that you definitely had crown gall, what do you do now? Um, the option of ripping up all the trees and removing them is probably not an option. Uh, but so what's the next best thing? Well, the next best thing would be to really fertilize the trees to encourage that root growth to compensate the compromise that's occurring in the roots, on the rootstock especially. The longevity of those trees, most likely their life expectancy shrinks as a result of the crown gall, but hopefully uh, you can get some time out of it then what I would recommend is that if you replant any period of time, even if you let that soil rest for a while, when you plant into that site again, you'd probably want to use that gall troll product because the agrobacterium will be living in the soil, unfortunately. So that's just an FYI. On the other picture where you showed the orchard, there was a tree, there were some trees that were dead. Here. Yeah. Did you dig those trees up? I'm trying to think if we dug those up, if we dug them up or not. Uh, I can't remember if we did or not. But I do, um, I don't think we did. I think we only focused on the trees that looked less robust. So, but these trees, I know the, well, this is what I do know. The grower was replacing at least 200 trees the first year and he was going to be replacing at least another 200 more. So more trees had died, the weakest links had died in, in, from 
in the 2016 season, I know. But you're confident that was crying I, all? In here, in the ones we yanked up in here? Is that what you're saying? No, or the ones that died? I, I don't know because we didn't pull those up. I mean, they died the year before also? I believe so, yeah, because he replaced 200 trees in the start of 2016. But he didn't know if they had crying all? He didn't know. He, how he knew is because I brought it up to him. So at that time, but I take that back. I did get one of his trees prior to visiting, and it was a compromised tree, and I did see some gall on that dead tree, the tree that had died sometime in the 2016 season. So I did see some crown gall. If, if you said these were virgin sites, could you trace it back to... A nursery or a rootstock line or nursery? So that's that that's the big big pink elephant in the room. <laughs> the the answer is yes. Um, okay. So in this is it lack of methyl bromide for fumigation that we're not. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I I really don't know. I mean, this is something. Um, I was in touch with this the nursery um, with this because uh, it there's a reason why I visited certain sites. It's because I knew where the trees came from. Um, but I, I didn't get that far in the conversation because they, they ended the conversation. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and I didn't push it. I, you know, I just provided them the information that I found, offered my services however best I could, and the conversation, I got a thank you. Thank you very much. And then the conversation ended. So. So I don't know if it's lack of methyl bromide. Someone yesterday at my meeting mentioned that about the lack of methyl bromide, of how it seems the incidence of crown gall on roses especially has increased since methyl bromide has been removed. So it probably is. It, it, there probably is a correlation between the two. So that's, that's my guess. Uh, so that's a good question. So there is a mix of bud 9 and M9337 with the, with these trees m9337 was more susceptible to it we saw the severity was more bud 9 did have it but not as bad where it seemed that the crown gall didn't the crown gall wasn't as big uh, the galls weren't as big on the bud 9 rootstocks so so yeah it so is. Oh, someone had, I heard. Does it mainly affect apples? Or oh, crown gall can affect, I mean, crown gall can affect, uh, I know you can see it on grapes and roses and apples and I, blackberries. Blackberries, I mean, it's pretty. Peaches, cherries. Peaches, cherry. I mean, nothing, I don't think anything is immune to, or I should say, um, not at risk for getting it, so. Would these trees, would this have been noticed on these trees when they came, when they got them from the nursery? That's a good question. Um, and I've asked the growers to get in touch with me prior to them planting their replacements because I wanted to take a closer look at them. For the galls being that big, I would say yes. They would, I, I, you know, I would think you would see something. But then there's the question of, could have the agrobacterium been hanging out somewhere on, at to some degree, even if the galls were small on these roots and, you know, as you're planting, there's lots of manipulation and the potential of creating wounds. So I would say for the galls being that big, that didn't happen overnight. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> it looks to the right of the picture there that's an older block of apples. In Over the here, yes. Now, what, what was in this site prior to... I think this was he he had this in corn. I mean the there was there was nothing there. All the sites I looked at had not been in tree fruit before and there hadn't been an issue of crown gall. Like this was all very new to them. You know, they were, you know, this was not on their radar at all. And and even when the trees I had a consultant look at these trees prior to me going to the site and when he brought the trees to me he said, I don't see anything. And I said, that's right there. And so like, I, th I don't think people's attention, are, they're just not drawn to looking at the rootstock. It doesn't pop out at them. So that's why I felt it was my extension plant pathologist duty to alert growers into making sure they're really ex inspecting their trees prior to planting. Any other quick questions? Yeah. I have a gooseberry bush. The tassel roots that go on some of the branches, 
and I've been pruning these branches off. Is that going to help at all or not? Um, well, I don't, I mean, well, goose, well, there's, a, well, so not knowing, I don't know if it's gall or does, does black knot, who's familiar, because there's a fungus that will cause galls on. It looks very much like these So does black knot. Black knot will look like this, too. I mean, not this, but it's like, it's on, uh, on the aerial part. It's uh. the same color as the bark. It's not black. I don't black. Yeah. Well, I mean, cutting it off helps. I mean, just because you're removing the source. Yeah. But uh, it could potentially be spreading it, too. That, you know, I'm not as familiar with, with that. Sometimes um, dwarfing rootstocks will get burr knots. Well, there's crazy. that, too. And, and, that, and, and I understand that, too. <clears throat> there's burr knots, too. So that's one thing that I didn't have a chance to. I wanted to put a picture of a burr knot. And I also want to put a picture of basically um, what woolly apple aphid will cause root swelling as well. But this is very distinct from both of those. Um, as well. So in the fact that we tested it, you know, the, this wasn't just a, a, a willy-nilly diagnosis, like it's this. We, this was, we found the Agrobacterium tumefaciens DNA in those galls, so. Well, they cut any trees or out of state. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't Pennsylvania trees. I won't say where. I'm not going to say where, but they weren't Pennsylvania trees. Yeah. They weren't. <laughs> and I'm saying that honestly, Jerry. I'm saying that honestly. <laughs> they weren't Pennsylvania trees, no. I, I noticed something else about this side. I don't think many of the people in this room would put an orchard like that into that drip. I don't see any drip in there. So Pennsylvania growers, they aren't consistent with using irrigation. <laughs> Um, which I found yeah, I mean, out. When you talk about stress on growth. Well, absolutely. So that was one of the, let's see, that may have been my last slide of crown gall, was that you want to minimize stress on the trees. So in order, you know, fertilize and also making sure irrigation. Uh, so that's, so yes. Uh, I mean, if we're putting a thousand trees into an acre, somebody's putting drip in. Oh, absolutely. And, but that's not a common thing with a lot of Pennsylvania growers. Uh, why? Sometimes I know it's an access to well, a well, um, but yeah. Any other quick questions about gall? Okay, I'm quickly going to go through this rapid apple decline. Um, Real quickly, so we've been noticing this for the last several years on dwarf trees and or sudden apple decline, either one. I think I'm going to stick with sudden apple decline because I like the acronym better. SAD, RAD, rapid apple decline sort of means like good. So it's going to be SAD. And the gist of this is, is that we see necrosis at the graft union and, it, and the tree just slowly girdles and then the next thing you know, it's dead. And in the case of this tree and many trees, we'll start seeing decline maybe like in July, August, and then in two weeks, boom, the tree's dead, even with a full, um, you know, a full crop on it. And so what we notice is that uh, we have found that M9, uh, but we don't know if it's just restricted to M9. M9 seems to be a common rootstock, M9337, NIC29. Uh, it's random. Uh, it's not affiliated with any pathogen that we're aware of as of yet, but we are finding latent viruses associated with it. We don't know what those latent viruses have an effect, but just to, I'm not going to go through this because I'm running out of time, but this is, this is sort of what we're looking for is that this is a weak tree it's, and lots of rootstock suckers. That's a diagnostic characteristics with the weak tree. Lots of rootstock suckers. You can peel the bark away from the graft union and then over time that necrosis will go up the tree and then it girdles the tree and it kills it. So this is a dead Fuji. So these are what different, this was a healthy graft union, a declining graft union, and then a dead tree. And then um, as far as healthy trees go, when you, we took a healthy tree, we did a cross section of it, and we were seeing necrosis in the center of the tree, which is a little disconcerting, which meant that the block where I got these trees, or where I had these trees, most likely they all were affected by this. So um, just, to, I want to go back to, um, let's see, graft union, root sucks, healthy, leaves, okay, trees collapse with a full, large, uh, 
a full load of fruit. I just want to quickly go through all of these. Is that, does anyone, can anyone in here relate to this? You can, okay. All right, good. Because I will be handing out a questionnaire for this. Um, what's that? Okay, I'm sorry. You're not alone. I'm, I'm, I am, we'll be happy to help you. <laughs> Uh, so basically, the, right now, there's, we don't know what's going on. So I've developed a questionnaire in conjunction with other pathologists in the Northeast Virginia, North Carolina, because this is beyond Pennsylvania borders. Uh, and so I have, it's, the questionnaire talks about tree, um, tree, the tree itself, how you've, like as far as herbicides, fertilization, even the nursery where you got it, cultivar root stock combination, and also the site. Uh, so we're trying to basically gather as much information as we can to see if there's any, if there are any commonalities. Is it just M9? I don't know. Is it Geneva? A Geneva root stocks affected? I have no idea. Bud 9? I don't know. Uh, right now, M9 is on our radar because those are the most trees we've seen so far. But that doesn't mean that it's limited to M9. Cultivars are all over the place. Fuji, Gala, Golden Delicious, Crimson Crisp. Those are the ones I know of so far. I'm sure there's more. So. Um, so yeah, so I have a questionnaire. So Guy, you need one, and Chris, did you, you want? I just want to make sure he gets one. Oh yeah, so just Guy, you just, you, is it anyone else besides Guy Moore? Just, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, let me take one for Karen Ray. Okay. It's a self-addressed, so it's, I have a stamp on it on ready. All you have to do is fill it out. So any quick questions about this rapid apple decline? Or anything I've talked about so far, probably like maybe a minute. Because I will be leaving. <laughs> so if anyone has any quick questions, I've got like a two and a half hour, three hour drive back. So I'm just going to head back. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you so much.